Hey, welcome back, True Seekers. I know you're all in quarantine and you're really concerned about going outside, but I did have an interesting moment yesterday where someone said, you know what, there's a lot of silver linings here. One of them is no school means no school shootings. Uh, and I was interesting. I said, you know what, I'm going to talk to a gentleman this week who knows who could tell you that you can't stop school shootings unless you actually know how they happen. Uh, the book is Why Meadow Died. The gentleman is Andy Pollock, father of Meadow Pollock, who passed away tragically in the school shooting in Florida in 20, uh, two years ago this February. Andy, how are you? Welcome. Oh, thanks for having me today. Hey, uh, I just want to thank you for coming on. I know we don't have a lot of time, and people aren't thinking about this as much as they probably should be, but we will go back to school. Life will get to nor back to normal. And if they're looking for something to do, I've told several people your book is BTN. It's better than Netflix, better than anything on Netflix. And uh, so I just want to take one second real quick and tell everyone that my issue with your book is I'm not going to remember everything that I wrote. I've got about four pages of audible notes here, and we won't have time to go over much of it. But I remember the way I felt when I was turning pages, when I was reading about how much ridiculous, avoidable nonsense led up to this event, which now you could, I think in your book, you say it was inevitable. And one thing I really like is that you open and close the book with a personal chapter. You call it a manifesto of you saying, here's who I was, here's who I, what I believed, here were my biases then, here's who I become, here's what I believe now. And it's really very moving. Can you give people a kind of quick overview of, uh, of your feelings on it and why you wrote the book? Well, I wrote the book uh, to educate parents uh, into what's going on at these public schools because I didn't know. And it, I now it's a manual, this book. Like any parent or grandparent that has a child in, in the public school system should read this book and to see what's going on. Because it doesn't matter how, like I lived in one of the safest communities in the country. But yet they allowed this type of person thing to go to school with my daughter and never tell any of the parents about really what's going on. And a lot of parents think, uh, don't know what's going on in the schools, just like I didn't know. And then it cost my daughter her life not knowing about the policies uh, that these bureaucrats put in place at a lot of these public schools. So it's really to educate. That's what I did. And my daughter would want every parent in the country to know what happened to her and why it happened. And that's what this book it tells the truth, not what the media, the fake news wanted about blaming the gun control, the NRA and all that BS. Uh, this is the truth of what happened with my investigation that I did over 10 months. You wrote in chapter 15 that a parent whose child has been beat up at a school by a bully will probably not tie it back to a national policy, nor would a parent whose child was stabbed to death by someone who threatened to bring a knife to school and then it wasn't reported. So when someone says, yeah, I'm sure a national policy had something to do with this shooting, it's guns. We all know it's guns. What do you tell them? You can't unload 16 chapters on them. How do you respond to that? It sounds too, too un it sounds unbelievable. Well, I tell them that it's it had nothing to do with it. You know what I mean? Uh, he could have, this person, they allow these type of children in the schools. They take, what they do is, in a nutshell, they'll take emotionally disturbed, violent children, okay, and they label them special needs, and they mainstream them into schools, uh, just the regular public schools. You know, people think when they hear special needs, they think of children with cerebral palsy, dyslexia, uh, just some type of uh, learning disability, but they take kids that are violent and they, they mainstream them. And that's what happened with my daughter's school. He was so violent, they had to frisk him every morning before school. He killed animals. He threatened to rape kids. He, uh, they, had to walk, they had to follow him around the school in middle school to the bathroom, to his classes, because he'd be screaming profanities, scaring people, uh, hiding behind uh, walls and corners. And he was just evil from, uh, from day one. But... They took it, you know, they had to mainstream them. And, and there's thousands of kids like the one that murdered my daughter throughout the country uh, in these public schools. It's no, uh, you know, there's the reason why there's none of these shootings are at private schools. Uh, you'll see if you look at it. Uh, they Private schools don't take these type of kids and, and they don't, uh, they won't tolerate it. There's consequences where in the public schools, uh, like when, for instance, when this, when my daughter was at school, the policy was a child was allowed three to four misdemeanors per school year without ever getting reported to law enforcement. 
And there's policies still in place at the school uh, where she went to. Very similar. Same thing. What's so the worst thing you can do? What's, a, what's the most uh, severe misdemeanor that wouldn't be reported? Just to give people an idea of what that means. What you can do three times. Uh, oh, you could sell drugs. You could rob an iPhone. You could assault another student. Those are misdemeanors. You could trespass. You could, you know, uh, sell you drugs is rampant in the school districts under the felony amount and they don't get reported. They could steal an iPhone. And uh, teachers are getting assaulted right now. The highest record numbers in the country, they're getting assaulted and, and abused because there's lack of consequences. In the opening chapter, you write a pretty heart-wrenching story about hearing about the shooting, hearing that something had happened, and you do the same thing that every loving parent does. You say, well, it's, it's not going to be my family. It's not going to be me. And then you kind of take us through what it's like to learn that it was you, and you had to go through it. But then later in the book, you did something I couldn't believe. You actually offer to uh, testify on behalf of the defendant in court. Take us through that uh, experience and why that was. Not really. Uh, not you know, to prevent him from getting the death penalty because he's up for the death penalty. And I, I would kill him myself if I had the opportunity. So it really, uh, I'm working with the defense only to get information that I wasn't privy to. So, because so many people failed, it wasn't just the killer that it was the sheriff's department, the mental health, the school district, all those people failed the, the administrators at the school. So for me, it's all about holding the other people accountable that let my daughter get murdered. Not just, uh, not just the killer. He's never going to see daylight, whether they kill him or not. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, you know, if they kill him, that's great. Uh, they put him in a, in a pen for the rest of his life. That's okay too. But I want to hold all the other people accountable that, that think it's okay to, to let a child, let this murderer in the school. And they had, they knew they had to frisk him. He was so dangerous. They frisked him every morning. He threatened other kids' lives, but never told any of us. They never told the parents what was going on in this school. And it was it's not just my daughter's school. That's what all these parents, all the, anyone that's listening, or any parent or grandparent out in the country, there's thousands of kids like this, emotionally disturbed and violent, where they're mainstreaming them. Just the shooter in Ohio, uh, he had a, uh, a year ago or so, uh, it was the Dayton shooter, same type of kid in school, uh, he had a hit list, a kill list, never was arrested, so he was able to go out and purchase a rifle. They were scared of him in school. Uh, you know, similar situation, but parents uh, that have no excuse anymore to say they didn't know this was going on in the schools because it's happening in over 60% uh, of the public schools in the country where they have these type of policies. So parents, if you're listening, uh, you know, I, everyone who writes me now, I don't even give them a long answer. I go, you got the options are private school, charter school, or homeschool. Uh, and those are your options when, when you're complaining about your school district. Uh, and that's what I tell them, you know, I would do anything uh, to take back time and put my daughter in a private school because she'd still be alive today. And whatever it would have cost, I, you know, I, I would have managed to come up with the money to make sure she was able to go to a private school. And that's what I tell parents or charter schools or uh, homeschool. It, it, because it's really, unless, you know, maybe some districts, parents could uh, have a grassroots organization and make a change. But if you read the book, we couldn't, you know, 17 people were murdered in Broward County uh, School District. And the same people are there just about making the same decisions. We, we tried to make a change and we couldn't change it. So that's why I tell parents private school. Part of the reason I want to reach out to you is when I read that last chapter about the failed school board run and trying to change things from the inside, you think, who would you listen to over people like Andy Pollack? Like, why, why is it you got to come to grips with the fact that maybe people really just don't care or don't listen? And that's why I wanted to have this interview, make sure people remember Meadows' name and learn about the things that you did and that you uncovered. And for the doubters, I know a lot of people didn't follow the case very clearly. They probably just thought, hey, someone got in there with a gun, shouldn't have happened, let's put metal detectors up, problem yeah. solved. Talk to us about the institutional issues. Talk to us about Robert Runcie, who people don't know anything about. And the fact that it wasn't just that he got through the gate with a rifle bag, the security guard saw him and didn't do anything that the Broward County Sheriff, who you would think listened to him talk, deserved a medal of honor, basically did nothing, not just that day, but for years prior to that. Talk to us about the institutional failure specifically. So parents really know what you're talking about. 
Well, the Broward Sheriff's Office uh, had over 40 calls to the killer's house, uh, and he was never arrested. If he would have been arrested once uh, for that, for, for any of those calls, for punching his mother's teeth out, uh, he wouldn't have been able to purchase a rifle. A year prior, he trespassed at the school when he wasn't a student there. He could have been arrested for that. Uh, things might have, things would have been different. Maybe he never goes back to the school if he got arrested. He was skinning animals, never arrested. So 40 calls to the house. Uh, Robert Runcy uh, is the superintendent. He came from uh, Chicago, where he had ties to Arnie Duncan. He was the uh, education secretary under Obama. So these policies uh, started with the Obama administration. Let's end the school to prison pipeline. Let's stop suspending. Let's lower expulsions and arrests for, uh, for kids uh, of color. And by doing that, uh, so Runcy brought that whole policy to Broward County uh, where he just stopped arresting and suspending and no expulsions for, for everyone. And what it does is it creates a culture of leniency throughout the whole school district where no one starts, you know, everyone's underreporting, no one's getting arrested. And it just creates this uh, uh, a culture of leniency. And this culture isn't just in Broward, it's throughout a, a lot of the major school districts. So if parents just think it's in Broward, no, this policy is throughout the country. Teachers, like a, if you, you could read it, I, I don't have the stats with me, but teachers are getting assaulted like at the highest numbers ever and it's going on so it, and that's why this word bullying came out there's a lot of bullying going on at all due to these policies uh, that are being implemented and they're not at the private schools that's why you don't really uh, hear about these type of things at private or well, and a lot of charter schools don't don't tolerate it you actually, at one point in the book, had a list called What Ifs, and you joked that there were a hundred ways that this could have been prevented, and all it would have taken was for adults to act like adults. And uh, But unfortunately, there's a, a uh, environment of corruption. In Broward, they couldn't even nominate their own school district chief, right? They weren't allowed to because the other one was in prison because of bribery and theft. And uh, there were a lot of people trying to fight from inside the system, but you mentioned at the end of the book, I think it was Ken, the, uh, the kid who was doing all the great actual journalism when the journalists weren't that he was really the only one out of this entire thing that got punished because he was talking too much and telling the truth a little bit too much. Uh, talk about your experience at the end of all this, trying to affect change and how that went. Well, that took a lot out of me. You know, we, we ran a school board race to try and put the right people in, you know, as school board members so that they could implement the right policies, you know, uh, take those policies out, hold children accountable because it doesn't matter what color a child is. They need to be have consequences. So you set them up to success in, in, in the right direction. And we came up, we couldn't get these people in there. Uh, we tried. I, I worked for months on it. It took, I, I needed like, that's my rooster. It took me uh, a few months just to recover from all the work we did on, on this, you know, door knocking. We, we knocked on over 40,000 doors. We had the uh, early polling, uh, we did mailers, we did so much stuff to, to try and make a change. But here you had these uh, bureaucrats in, in Broward County that, uh, you know, most of them were Democrats. This is where I really stopped liking Democrats is when, when I read it, when I learned about all these policies and who, who behind it. You know, the sheriff was a Democrat, he signed on to these policies, the superintendent a Democrat, uh, the uh, supervisor of elections who got removed in Broward County, she was another Democrat. The whole school board's a bunch of Democrats. So, you know, this is where I really got a bad taste in my mouth, the Democrats, and I started looking into them. And really, most of them were pretty uh, not ethical type of people, the ones in Broward that I met. So, and we tried to fix it, and we couldn't fix Broward. I moved out of Broward. You could hear my rooster. I'm out in the country. I live on a 350-acre ranch. Oh, wow. And I'm done with areas like Broward, you know, about living in, a, in an area like Broward. But I do have, uh, I started a new organization to help parents and school districts and police departments. Uh, it's called schoolsafetygrant.org. You should uh, go on my website, schoolsafetygrant.org. And it's a, something I've been working on uh, to help law enforcement on response time. It's going to cut response time off of minutes uh, 
when they're responding to any type of uh, situation or an active shooter. Uh, I did a lot of research with another company, and we have this technology. And really, we were, we were throughout the Florida and D.C. right before this coronavirus started, uh, showing this technology. And we, we actually were able to get some grant money to different departments in, in the state of Florida to help them with their technology. So it's a, it's a free grant. And if anyone's listening or they want to check it out, that'd be great. Schoolsafetygrant.org. Schoolsafetygrant.org. Um, I know the rooster's yep. calling you. I'm going to, I'm going to link to this and, uh, with the hashtag fix it. And I also just, I want to close great. here. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm listening to you. Go ahead. I just, there are certain, I had a couple highlighted here as a parent. I have two daughters, one of them starting school, one of them has not. And there are times when I read this book, one in yep. particular where the, the murderer had harassed and physically threatened a girl. And then the and you're going to correct me if I get this wrong, the superintendents and their wisdom had a, basically a buddy system they put together where they paired the murderer with this girl to have her tutor him as part of his, kind of like yeah. what they do with Wuhan where they say everyone in Italy hug a Chinese person. I mean, it, was just, it terrorizes yeah. this poor girl. And then a couple of pages later, you talk about how uh, he goes and asks a girl for a hug and the teacher comes over and taps her on the shoulder and says, yeah, don't hug him. He just got caught masturbating. And I thought, wait a minute, there are adult teachers who get paid to protect kids that allow this to happen and it just can and it snowballs until the inevitable occurs <laughs> two years have passed uh, this is what's going on. yeah, I, yeah. I, just, I, wanted yeah. To have, I just i wanted you to have i wanted to share your voice if you have children this is a man's book you need to read his work you need to understand what he went through and how preventable hilariously incompetent and preventable this was because of the incompetent and um and bureaucratic system that's in place that allows these things to happen. Uh, uh, Mr. Pollock, I'm going to give you the final word on hashtag fix it. Well, if I'm a parent now, I would do anything possible to put my child in a private school. I, you know, I tell people, sell a kidney. Uh, do whatever you can to get your child in a private school or a charter school. But not, you know, maybe small districts that are uh, public are okay, but these mega districts or big school districts that have these type of Nancy Pelosi's running the school districts. They're all the same, uh, those bureaucrats, these liberal bureaucrats that run a lot of these big school districts, uh, like a Chuck Schumer, like a Nancy Pelosi. You wouldn't want them uh, in charge of educating you, your children. So I say to them, do whatever you can and get your child. Read my book. Do whatever you can to put your child in a private school uh, where they're, they're not going to be subjected to uh, violent, disturbed children mainstream, and, and a, a lot of uh, lax discipline policies. Kids have consequences at private school where they get away with a lot more in these public schools. So, and, and that would be my words to, to most parents now raising children, and you yourself. Do whatever you can to get your daughter in a private school. Andy, thank you for your time. Uh, God bless you for the work that you've done, and uh, we, and we'll do our part to try to get the message out. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care. Yeah, come here, babe. Oh, what you got? Hey, come here. Want to look at the camera? Hey. What's that? Say, sub please subscribe. Please subscribe. Yay. Say bye-bye. Say bye-bye. 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 That was fun. Good job. Good job.